everyone. I had some thoughts on a woman named Dr. Mary Ruart, because she's actually been popping up a little bit more recently. The first time I ever heard about her was way back in 2008 when she ran um, for the Libertarian nomination for president. Um, she didn't get it, um, but it was a good effort. She was actually my favorite of all the people running, probably besides Ron Paul. And it was really interesting to see her come up on, um, it was one of a, uh, it was Peter Schiff has like a sub channel related to gold. I don't know if it's actually his or not, but it's some Peter Schiff gold channel where they interviewed her recently and they had a really great conversation. I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll link that in the description as well as a few different studies that support some of the, the more, I guess, flamboyant or really, really out there claims that she's made. And um, obviously, it's a little bit beyond me, at least at this time, to give a strong opinion as to whether or not I think these things are true, because it's a very complicated question. But her claim is that, you know, 15 million Americans have died while waiting for FDA approval on certain drugs, and that on average, the FDA has shaved about five to 10 years off of the lives of most people. Now, if you consider the fact that, you know, if, if you murder somebody, you know, just because they would have died naturally five to ten years later, we wouldn't consider that not murder, right? So, in a way, you could consider these to be genocide. You could consider this to be murder, to be death. And the reason I think it's appropriate to put this into these terms is because very often you'll see people criticize capitalism. And what they'll basically do is argue that anytime a person starves to death, that this is the fault of capitalism. And then they'll just add that to the death toll of capitalism because they have to get the number up there in order to make some sort of a comparison to all the people who died under you know, very explicitly defined communism or socialism. And the reason that this is so relevant right now is because if you've watched these democratic debates, these people are openly discussing making private health care illegal in America. And it really speaks to the arrogance of supporting democracy. And these people sicken me. They absolutely make me sick. And they should be shamed. I see them as people who are genocidal. Because if you consider that this claim is true, these people are openly calling for and supporting more of what already defines the status quo. One thing that's very tricky is that when it, when, whenever a person refers to the free market or privatization, they, they don't realize the degree to which the government has taken over the market. And very often when you start to point these things out, um, people who are very left-minded, they think it's very unfair. They say, well, that's not fair because that means I, I don't have any information that could possibly criticize you. But that doesn't make the point invalid. The fact is they felt so entitled to their own opinion that they've forced these regulations upon people at every single stage uh, of, of the economy, right? From from the money all the way up through everything, including these regulations. Now, what's very interesting about looking at the FDA is that it's sort of just one thing that you can point to that has this immediate, um, th these immediate implications surrounding it that are very interesting. So I want to go ahead and just read some excerpts from a few of the links provided that, that support these claims. The 1962 Drug Amendments seeks to prevent wasted expenditure stipulated, sorry, stimulated by exaggerated claims for effectiveness of new drugs by requiring pre-marketing approval of all new drugs claims by the Food and Drug Administration. The compliance costs are shown to have engendered a marked reduction in drug innovation. Consumer surplus analysis is then adapted and supplemented with expert drug evaluations to establish the relevant benefits and costs. The main finding is that benefits foregone on effective new drugs exceed greatly the waste avoided on ineffective drugs. The estimated net impact is equivalent to a 5-10% to tax on drug purchases. That's from the abstract of um, a study called An Evaluation of Consumer Drug Protection Legislation, the 1962 Drug Amendments by uh, Sam Peltzman, University of California. This one was published in the Journal of Political Economy. Um, 
looks like 1973, so a little bit older. I'll go ahead and link to this. It looks like it's not really available for free. It's only there for downloaded. They only have the abstract there, which is what I just read to you. That's one of the links they provide. It's unfortunate that it's not available for free. But the other one has a pretty lengthy, lengthy article here. Let's see, and this one is at healthaffairs.org. In the section called Drug Review as a Stopping Problem, in reviewing NDAs, the FDA must choose not only whether to approve, but when to approve. Every time the FDA reviews a new drug, it invests, takes a chance with its reputation. There are three critical aspects of this decision. The inherent uncertainty. FDA officials know that even the most successful clinical trials cannot eliminate the possibility that a drug will turn out to be unsafe or inefficacious. Consider, for example, the 1996 review of Smith Klein Breachman's Requip, or Ropinrol, Rop- Ropinrol, for idiopathic Parkinson's disease. In this summary memorandum, FDA official Paul Lieber discussed Requip's safety data and added an important cautionary note. Because no pharmacologically active drug substance is entirely free of risk, the conclusion that a drug has been shown to be safe for use is actually no more than an opinion. Accordingly, risk-to-benefit assessments are inherently arguable, all the more so because each turns not only on personal sentiments about the nature of risks and benefits of a drug, but upon incomplete and imperfect information concerning the drug's risks. Similarly, in 1997, FDA official Rudolf Widmark summarized safety data from Wyeth's Duract, um, bromfenaxodium, for post-operative pain relief and cautioned, In our safety review of NDA study, we usually do not get definitive answers based on unequivocal data, but are forced to interpret flagging events. We think that in the case of Bromfenac, we have seen a liver flag that can only be fully explored through responsible marketing of the drug. They note that some uncertainty will always remain in drug review, and the marginal benefit for more trials and more delays tends to decline as the drug review gets longer. The next part is really interesting about asymmetric observability error. In the language of decision theory, a type 1 error occurs when a decision maker accepts as true a hypothesis that is in fact false, and a type 2 error occurs when a decision maker rejects a hypothesis that is in fact true. The FDA then may be said to commit a type 1 error when it approves a bad drug, and a type 2 error when it fails to approve a drug that should have been approved. For most of the FDA's history, type 1 errors have been more visible than type 2 errors. As the, remarks, as the remarks from former Commissioner Schmidt illustrate, the FDA has often been exoriated for approving a bad drug or approving it too quickly, and only recently has been criticized for approving drugs too slowly. And the third section I want to read out from here is um, low reputational reversibility. Finally, the damage of a faulty approval decision is difficult to undo. Of course, the FDA can always secure a recall of a faulty product or compel the manufacturer to attach a black box warning, yet these steps will only publicize the error that the agency has made. Even though drug approvals are procedurally reversible, the FDA views drug approval as irreversible from the standpoint of reputation. And that's all I'm going to read for now, but the reason I wanted to highlight a little bit of this is because, for one, the FDA, what it does in approving a drug, doesn't even come with any sort of a guarantee. And this is often the grounds on which people would criticize the idea of having free market regulation, where you have private groups that offer their own seals of approval. And even when it comes to a so-called like black box warning, there's no reason that couldn't be part of the review process. That they say, hey, we'll review your drug and we'll give you our seal of approval, which is you know highly sought after because of our reputation. But if it turns out there's an issue, you're going to have to put a black box warning on it. That can absolutely be part of a contract. So basically, there's no reason that different independent companies um, that, that offer you know, their seal of approval, that they wouldn't be able to do a lot of what the FDA already does. The only difference being that people are free to sell and offer drugs without such approval, and that people are free to make that risk for themselves. They're already making a risk or a cost-benefit analysis and choosing to trust, um, you know, the FDA. So why not have multiple different competing FDAs? And it's very funny. We all accept this idea that the FDA has a reputation and that there's irreversible effects to making bad decisions and and bad errors. 
So it just logically follows that this same reputational you know, calculus would apply to private groups. And in fact, would be more important because they'd actually be competing. Now, what's interesting about the distinction between the type 1 versus type 2 errors is that, you know, the FDA came out of a lot of hysteria over bad drugs being approved. That's why it exists, and that's what people immediately think of when they think of the FDA. They think, oh, this is a, a thing that's there to help us make sure that very awful drugs don't come to market. It, it puts a stopper on it. But what we don't consider is the alternative, that there are drugs that are very good, drugs that we should be trying that just aren't being allowed. Now, Dr. Ruart often looks at drugs that have already been approved in other first world countries and just are not approved in the United States yet. And this is, I think, where she gets a lot of her data and a lot of her information and why her estimate is, I think, um, I suspect, um, pretty conservative and pretty easy to, to back up. But... um. What's really sad is later on in this article, they, they go on to talk about things like lobbying, like, right? These like pressure groups. And it's very sad to me that all of this effort is going to lobby the government and go through these systems to make the FDA, you know, make better decisions. When in reality, all of this effort could go towards research. All of this effort could go towards spreading awareness and having freedom. And then when you consider that having access to more of these drugs out in the market will give us more information and more data and more experimentation to eventually lead to cheaper drugs, to lead to more effective drugs, you know, it, it really is insane the amount of cost the FDA is. So um, the way I see it is if you support the FDA, the existence of the FDA, don't you ever breathe a word about how you think Nazis are evil? How dare you? The United States is a concentration camp. Absolutely. The United States is a concentration camp, and this is essentially human experimentation. If you support regulation by the government, you're a terrible person. Just full stop. It's just a common sense, obviously pro-liberty, and the only ethically permissible position to have is to completely get rid of the FDA. And every single person who stands on that stage of the DNC talking about, oh, well, let's try this plan or that plan, you know, they're experimenting with human lives and they have absolutely no right to do it. And you know what? Since they are willing to call Trump Hitler, since they're willing to say that libertarians have no heart, you know what? Let's turn that same rhetoric on them. Let's turn that same rhetoric on them. Let's take the deaths of all these people. Let's take the shaved life expectancies off of everybody in America and throw that at their feet. And this is why I say every single person who breathed the word in defense of Obamacare deserves to be indentured into slavery. And they should be the last to be served because they wanted to twist everyone's arm to force everyone into their stupid system. So when there's shortages, they're the ones who ought to go without. The last bit, um, you can actually get the whole paper here. It's a 25-page paper. And, um, yeah, this one I haven't quite read through yet, but I'm going to include that in the um, in, in, in my, my comments box. Sorry, in my description box. So that one's also available. I'm going to take a look at it a little bit later. And um, I guess if there's anything really, really crazy or noteworthy in there, I'll make sure I highlight that as well. It's from Cato Journal. I'm wondering if that's related to the Cato Institute. I'm sure that's going to be a reason people will discredit it just for being Cato. Um, maybe it's not related. I'm really not not exactly in the know. But I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, so I hope everybody has a nice day. And keep it easy.